Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated on the 30th of January 1948 in the compound of Birla House, now Gandhi Smriti, a large mansion. His assassin was Nathuram Vinayak Godse, a right-wing advocate of Hindu nationalism, a member of the political party the Hindu Mahasabha, and a past member of the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh (RSS), which he left in 1940 to form an armed organization. Godse had planned the assassination. Gandhi had just walked up the low steps to the raised lawn behind Birla House where he conducted his multi-faith prayer meetings every evening. Godse stepped out from the crowd flanking the path leading to the dais and into Gandhi's path, firing three bullets at point-blank range. Gandhi instantly fell to the ground. Gandhi was carried back to his room in Birla House from where a representative emerged some time later to announce that he had died. The Gandhi murder trial opened in May 1948 in Delhi's historic Red Fort, with Godse the main defendant, and his collaborator Narayan Apte and six others as the co-defendants. According to Markovitz 2004, Godse tried to dot use the courtroom as a political forum by reading a long declaration in which he attempted to justify his crime. He accused Gandhi of complacency towards Muslims, blamed him for the sufferings of partition, and generally criticized his subjectivism and pretension to a monopoly of the truth. Quote, According to J. Edward Mallet 2012, Godse blamed Gandhi for continuing to appease Muslims in such a manner that my blood boiled and I could tolerate him no longer. The trial was rushed through, the haste sometimes attributed to the Home Minister Vallabhbhai Patel's desire. To avoid scrutiny for the failure to prevent the assassination, the trial was public, but the statement that Nathuram Godse gave during the trial on why he killed Gandhi was immediately banned by the Indian government. Godse and APTE were sentenced to death on 8 November 1949. They were hanged in the Ambala jail on 15 November 1949. Preparations. In early September 1947, Gandhi had moved to Delhi in order to help stem the violent rioting there and in the neighbouring province of East Punjab. The rioting had come in the wake of the partition of the British Indian Empire, which had accompanied the creation of the new independent dominions of India and Pakistan, and involved large, chaotic transfers of population between them. Nathuram Vinayak Godse, and his assassination accomplices, were residents of the Deccan region. Godse had previously led a civil disobedience movement against Osman Ali Khan, the Muslim ruler of the princely Deccan region dominion of Hyderabad state in British India. Godse joined a protest march in 1938 in Hyderabad, where Hindus were being discriminated against, according to Featherling. He was arrested for political crimes and served a prison sentence. Once he was out of prison, Godse continued his civil disobedience and worked as a journalist reporting the sufferings of Hindu refugees escaping from Pakistan, and during the various religious riots that erupted in the 1940s. According to Arvind Sharma, the concrete plans to assassinate Gandhi were initiated by Godse and his accomplices in 1948, after India and Pakistan had already started a war over Kashmir. The government of India, led by Congress leaders, had withheld a payment to Pakistan in January 1948 because it did not want to finance Pakistan, which was at war with India at that time. Gandhi opposed the decision to freeze the payment, and went on a fast unto death on 13 January 1948 to pressure the Indian government to release the payment to Pakistan. The Indian government, yielding to Gandhi, reversed its decision. Godse and his colleagues interpreted this sequence of events to be a case of Gandhi controlling power and hurting India. On the day Gandhi went on hunger strike, Godse and his colleagues began planning how to assassinate Gandhi. Nathuram Vinayak Godse and Narayan Apte purchased a Beretta M1934. Along with purchasing the pistol, Godse and his accomplices shadowed Gandhi's movements. Assassination Topic The 20th of January 1948 Gandhi had initially been staying at the scheduled Kast Bamiki Temple near Goal Market in the northern part of New Delhi and holding his prayer meetings there when the temple was requisitioned for sheltering refugees of the partition he moved to Birla House, a large mansion on what was then Albuquerque Road in south-central New Delhi, not far from the diplomatic enclave. 
Gandhi was living in two unpretentious rooms in the left wing of Birla House, and conducting prayer meetings on a raised lawn behind the mansion. The first attempt to assassinate Gandhi at Birla House occurred on 20 January 1948. According to Stanley Wolpert, Nathram Godse and his colleagues followed Gandhi to a park where he was speaking. One of them threw a grenade away from the crowd. The loud explosion scared the crowd, creating a chaotic stampede of people. Gandhi was left alone on the speaker's platform. The original assassination plan was to throw a second grenade, after the crowds had run away, at the isolated Gandhi. But the alleged accomplice Digambar Baj lost his courage, did not throw the second grenade and ran away with the crowd. All of the assassination plotters ran away, except Madanlal Pawa who was a Punjabi refugee of the partition of India. He was arrested. Topic: The 30th of January 1948. Topic: Manuban Gandhi. Manu Gandhi, called Manuban, in Gujarati fashion, was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi's great niece, more precisely, a first cousin twice removed. Abba Chatterjee, Ababan Chatterjee was a girl adopted by the Gandhis who would later marry Gandhi's great-nephew, Kanu Gandhi. They were walking with Gandhi when he was assassinated. According to Last Glimpses of Bapu, a memoir by Manuban Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi Bapu started the day in Birla Bhawan by listening to a recitation of the Bhagavad Gita. He then worked on a Congress constitution he wanted to publish in the Harijan, had his bath and massage at 8 a.m., and reprimanded Manubin to take care of herself since her health was not what it should be for an 18-year-old. Gandhi, aged 78, was weighed after his bath and was 109.5 pounds He then ate lunch with Piarelalji discussing Nokali violence. After lunch, states Manubin, Gandhi napped. After waking up, he had a meeting with Sardar Dada. Two Kathiawar leaders wanted to meet him, and when Manubin informed Gandhi that they wanted to meet him, Gandhi replied, Tell them that, if I remain alive, they can talk to me after the prayer on my walk. According to Manubin's memoir the meeting between Sardar Dada and Gandhi went past the scheduled time and Gandhi was about ten minutes late to the prayer meeting. He began his walk to the prayer location by walking with Manubin to his right and Abba to his left, holding onto them as walking sticks. A stout young man in khaki dress, wrote Manubin, pushed his way through the crowd bent over and with his hands folded. Manubin thought that the man wanted to touch Gandhi's feet. She pushed the man aside saying, Bapu is already ten minutes late, why do you embarrass him? Godse pushed her aside so forcibly that she lost her balance and the rosary, notebook, and Gandhi's spittoon she was carrying, fell out of her hands. She recalled that as she bent to the ground to pick up the items she heard four shots, resounding booms, and she saw smoke everywhere. Gandhi's hands were folded, with his lips saying, Hey Ra! Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 ma. Hey Ra! Ababan, wrote Manubin, had also fallen down and she saw the assassinated Gandhi in Ababan's lap. The pistol shots had deafened her, wrote Manubin, the smoke was very thick, and the incident complete within three to four minutes. A crowd of people rushed towards them, according to Manubin. The watch she was carrying showed 5.17 p.m. and blood was everywhere on their white clothes. Manubin estimated that it took about ten minutes to carry Gandhi back into the house, and no doctor was available in the meanwhile. They only had a first aid box, but there was no medicine in it for treating Gandhi's wounds. According to Manubin, the first bullet from the assassin's seven-bore automatic hit the belly 3.5 inches to the right of the middle and 2.5 inches above the navel, the second hit the belly one inch away from middle, and the third four inches away to the right. Gandhi had suffered profuse blood loss. Everyone was crying loudly. In the house, Bai Saheb had phoned the hospital many times, but was unable to reach any help. He then went to Willingdon Hospital in person, but came back disappointed. Manubin and others read Gita as Gandhi's body lay in the room. Colonel Bhargava arrived, and he pronounced Gandhi dead. <inaudible> <inaudible> Herbert Reiner According to some reports, while the attending crowd was still in shock, Gandhi's assassin Godse was seized by Herbert Reiner Jr., a 32-year-old, newly arrived vice-consul at the American Embassy in Delhi. 
According to an obituary for Reiner published in May 2000 by the Los Angeles Times, Reiner's role was reported on the front pages of newspapers around the world. According to Stratton, 1950, on January 30, 1948, Reiner had reached Birla House after work, arriving 15 minutes before the scheduled start of the prayer meeting at 5 p.m., and finding himself in a relatively small crowd. Although there were some armed guards present, Reiner felt that the security measures were inadequate, especially in view of an attempted bomb explosion at the same location ten days before. By the time Gandhi and his small party reached the garden area a few minutes after five, the crowd had swelled to several hundred, which Reiner described as comprising schoolboys, girls, sweepers, members of the armed services, businessmen, sadists, holy men, and even vendors displaying pictures of Bapu. At first, Reiner had been at some distance from the path leading to the dais, but he moved forward, explaining later, "...an impulse to see more, and at a closer range, of this Indian leader impelled me to move away from the group in which I had been standing to the edge of the terrace steps." As Gandhi was walking briskly up the steps leading to the lawn, an unidentified man in the crowd spoke up, somewhat insolently in Reiner's recollection, "...Gandhiji, you are late." Gandhi slowed down his pace, turned toward the man, and gave him an annoyed look, passing directly in front of Reiner at that moment. But no sooner had Gandhi reached the top of the steps, than another man, a stocky Indian man, in his thirties, and dressed in khaki clothes, stepped out from the crowd and into Gandhi's path. He soon fired several shots up close, at once felling Gandhi. A BBC correspondent Robert Stimson described what happened next in a radio report filed that night. For a few seconds no one could believe what had happened, everyone seemed dazed and numb. And then a young American who had come for prayers rushed forward and seized the shoulders of the man in the khaki coat. That broke the spell. Half a dozen people stooped to lift Gandhi. Others hurled themselves upon the attacker. He was overpowered and taken away. Others, as well, described how the crowd seemed paralyzed until Rayner's action. Robert Trumbull of the New York Times, who was an eyewitness, described Rayner's action in a front-page story on January 31, 1948. The assassin was seized by Tom Rayner of Lancaster, Mass., a vice consul attached to the American embassy and a recent arrival in India. Mr. Rayner grasped the assailant by the shoulders and shoved him towards several police guards. Only then did the crowd begin to grasp what had happened and a forest of fists belabored the assassin. Reiner too had noticed a man in khaki step into the path leading to the dais, but his further view was occluded by a party of associates following Gandhi. He soon heard sounds, though, which in his words were, "...not loud, not ringing, and not unlike the reports of damp firecrackers," and which for a moment made him wonder if some sort of celebration was underway. The details and the role of Reiner in seizing Godse vary by the source. According to Frank Alston, Reiner stated that Goodse stood nearly motionless with a small beretta dangling in his right hand and to my knowledge made no attempt to escape or to take his own fire. Moving toward Godse I extended my right arm in an attempt to seize his gun but in doing so grasped his right shoulder in a manner that spun him into the hands of Royal Indian Air Force men, also spectators, who disarmed him. I then fastened a firm grasp on his neck and shoulders until other military and police took him into custody. According to Tunzelman, Godse was seized and pummeled by Reiner. According to Khalid Gauba, Reiner was the unsung hero, and had he not acted, Godse would probably have shot his way out. Reiner was standing in the front row, states Pramid Kapoor, and he seized and held Godse till the police arrived, but his name only appeared in some American newspapers. According to Bamzai and Damal, during the assassination trial, the government did not call to the stand American Marine Herbert Tom Reiner who caught Godse or the nephew of then Congress Minister Takmal Jain of Madhya Bharat Ministry 1948, as well as many others. Other reports According to other reports, Godse surrendered voluntarily and asked for the police. Yet other reports state he was rushed by the crowd, beaten, arrested, and taken to jail. According to some eyewitnesses and court proceedings, Nathuram Godse was seized immediately by witnesses and an Indian Air Force officer dispossessed him of the pistol. The crowd beat him to a bloodied state. The police wrested him loose from the angry crowd, took him to jail. 
A fur was filed by Nadlal Mehta at the Tughlaq Road Police Station at Delhi. The 31 January 1948 issue of The Guardian, a British newspaper, described Gandhi as walking from the Birla House to the lawn where his evening prayer meetings were held. Gandhi was a bit late for the prayer, leaning on the shoulders of two grand nieces. On his way, he was approached by a man Godse, dressed in a khaki bush jacket and blue trousers. Godse greeted him with a namaste, the customary Hindu salute. According to one version, stated the Guardian, Gandhi smiled back and spoke to Godse, then the assailant pulled out a pistol and fired three times, at point-blank range, into Gandhi's chest, stomach and groin. Gandhi died at 5.40 p.m., about half an hour after he was shot, according to the Guardian report, which did not mention Herbert Reiner Jr., Godse, "...fired a fourth shot, apparently in an effort to kill himself, but a Royal Indian Air Force sergeant standing alongside jolted his arm and wrenched the pistol away. The sergeant wanted to shoot the man but was stopped by the police." An infuriated crowd fell upon the man and beat him with sticks, but he was apprehended by the police and taken to a police station." Godse was questioned by reporters, who in English replied that he was not sorry to have killed Gandhi and awaited his day in court to explain his reasons. Vincent Sheehan was another eyewitness and an American reporter who had covered World War II events. He went to India in 1947 and became a disciple of Gandhi. He was with the BBC reporter Bob Stimson in Birla House premises when Gandhi was assassinated. They stood next to each other by the corner of a wall. According to Sheehan, Gandhi walked across the grass in their direction, leaning lightly, on two of the girls, and two or three others following them. Gandhi wrapped in a homespun shawl passed them by, states Sheehan's eyewitness account, and climbed up four or five steps to the prayer ground. As usual, according to Sheehan, there was a clump of people, some of whom were standing and some of whom had gone on their knees or bent low before him. Bob and I turned to watch we were perhaps ten feet away from the steps but the clump of people cut off our view of the Mahatma now, he was so small." Then, states Sheehan, he heard, four, dull, dark explosions. Sheehan asked Stimson, "'What's that?' Stimson replied, "'I don't know.' It was a confusing place, people were weeping and many things happening, wrote Sheehan. A doctor was found, the police took charge, the body of the Mahatma was carried away, the crowd melted, perhaps urged to do so by the police, I saw none of this. Stimson filed a BBC report, then he and Sheehan walked up and down the flower bed for a while. Sheehan reported that he later met a young American from the embassy, who had never been to a prayer meeting before. Sheehan did not take in anything the young American said about the scene, but a week later learned that, "...it was this young man who had captured the assassin, held him for the Indian police." And after turning the assassin over, it was this young American who searched the crowd for a doctor. He experienced a tribal pride, states Sheehan, that even though he was paralyzed and helpless on the day of Gandhi's assassination, "...one of his breed had been useful," according to Ashish Nandi, before firing the shots Godse bowed down to Gandhi to show his respect for the services the Mahatma had rendered the country, he made no attempt to run away and himself shouted for the police." According to Pramod Das, Godse after firing the shots raised his hand with the gun, surrendered and called for the police. According to George Featherling, Godse did not try to flee, he "...stood silently waiting to be arrested but was not approached at first because he was still armed, at last a member of the Indian Air Force grabbed him by the wrist, and Godse released his weapon." Police, states Featherling, then, "...quickly surrounded Godse to prevent the crowd from lynching him." According to Matt Doden and others, "...Godse did not flee the scene, and he voluntarily surrendered himself to the police." Death According to some accounts, Gandhi died on the spot. In other accounts, such as one prepared by an eyewitness journalist, Gandhi was carried back into the Birla house, into a bedroom, where he died about 30 minutes later as one of Gandhi's family members read verses from Hindu scriptures. Motives <inaudible> 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 During the subsequent trial, and in various witness accounts and books written since, the motivation of Godse has been summarized, speculated about and debated. 
Godse did not deny killing Gandhi, and made a long statement explaining his motivations for the assassination. Some of these motivations were Godse felt that the massacre and suffering caused during, and due to, the partition could have been avoided if Gandhi and the Indian government had acted to stop the killing of the minorities Hindus and Sikhs in West and East Pakistan. He stated Gandhi had not protested against these atrocities being suffered in Pakistan and had instead resorted to fasts. In his court deposition, Godse said, I thought to myself and foresaw I shall be totally ruined, and the only thing I could expect from the people would be nothing but hatred if I were to kill Gandhiji. But at the same time I felt that the Indian politics in the absence of Gandhiji would surely be proved practical, able to retaliate, and would be powerful with armed forces." Godse called Gandhi subjective, someone who pretended to have a monopoly on truth. He stated that Gandhi thought of himself as the final judge of what is true or false, right or wrong, and the suffering of Hindus did not matter to him. Godse claimed that his group of volunteers and he were social workers who had worked across religious and caste boundaries for years to help their fellow Indians, and he was upset with Gandhi's actions and willingness to ignore non-Muslim interests and make concessions to Muslims. Godse said that Gandhi exploited the feelings of tolerant Hindus with one-sided practices. Gandhi's recent prayer meetings in Hindu temples, said Godse, had started the practice of reading passages from the Quran, despite Hindus protesting this practice. However, according to Godse, Gandhi dared not read the Gita in a mosque in the teeth of Muslim opposition. And Gandhi knew what a terrible Muslim reaction would have been if he had done so. Godse alleged that Gandhi knew it is safe to trample on the tolerant Hindu. Godse wanted to show that a Hindu too can be intolerant. Godse stated that Gandhi's fast to pressure the Indian government to release the final payment to Pakistan that it had previously frozen because of the war in Kashmir, and the Indian government's subsequent policy reversal, was proof that the Indian government reversed its decision to suit the feelings of Gandhi. India, said Godse, was not being run by the force of public opinion, but by Gandhi's whims. Godse added that he admired Gandhi for his lofty character, ceaseless work and asceticism, and Gandhi's formidable character meant that his influence outside of the due process would continue while he was alive. Gandhi had to be removed from the political stage, so that India can begin looking after its own interests as a nation, according to Godse. Godse stated he did not oppose Gandhian Ahimsa teachings, but Gandhi's talk of religious tolerance and nonviolence had already caused India to cede Pakistan to Muslims, uprooted millions of people from their home, caused immense violent loss of life and broken families. He believed that if Gandhi was not checked he would bring destruction and more massacres to Hindus. In Godse's opinion, the only answer to violent aggression was violent self-defense. Godse stated that. Gandhi had betrayed his Hindu religion and culture by supporting Muslims at the expense of Hindus, because his lectures of ahimsa were directed at and accepted by the Hindu community only. Godse said, I sat brooding intensely on the atrocities perpetrated on Hinduism and its dark and deadly future if left to face Islam outside and Gandhi inside, and I decided all of a sudden to take the extreme step against Gandhi. I did not hate Gandhi, I revered him because we both venerated much in Hindu religion, Hindu history and Hindu culture, we both were against superstitious aspects and the wrongs in Hinduism. Therefore I bowed before Gandhi when I met him, said Godse, then performed my moral duty and killed Gandhi. <laughs> Trial and judgments The assassination was investigated, and many additional people were arrested, charged and tried in a lower court. The case and its appeal attracted considerable media attention, but Godse's statement in his defense to the court was banned immediately by the Indian government. Those convicted were either executed or served their complete sentences. <laughs> Investigation and arrests Along with Nathuram Godse many other accomplices were arrested. 
They were all identified as prominent members of the Hindu Mahasabha, an organization active in opposing the Muslim ruler of the princely state of Hyderabad state in the Deccan region. Before the Indian Army forcibly removed the Nizam in Operation Polo in September 1948, along with Godse and accomplices, police arrested the 65 year old Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, who they accused of being the mastermind behind the plot. Arrested The accused, their place of residence, caste and occupational background were as follows Nathuram Vinayak Godse, Pune, Maharashtra, Brahmin, editor, journalist Narayan Apte, Pune, Maharashtra, Brahmin, former British military service, teacher, newspaper manager Digambar Baj, Ahmednagar, Maharashtra, Shudra, weapons merchant Shankar Kisteya, Pune, Maharashtra, Shudra, Rickshaw Puller, domestic servant of Digambar Baj Datatreya Parchor, Gwalior, Madhya Pradesh, Brahmin, medical service, care giver Vishnu Karkari, Ahmednagar, Maharashtra, Shudra, orphan, odd jobs in hotels, musician in a traveling troupe, volunteer in relief efforts to religious riots Nokali, later restaurant owner Madanlal Pawa, Ahmednagar refugee camp, Maharashtra, caste unknown, former British Indian Army soldier, unemployed, Punjabi refugee who migrated to India from Pakpatan, Pakistan, on the eve of partition, after his father and aunt were massacred by a Muslim mob. Gopal Godse, Pune, Maharashtra, Brahmin and brother of Nathuram Godse, storekeeper, merchant. Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, Mumbai, Maharashtra, Brahmin, author, lawyer, former president of Ukhil Bharatiya Hindu Mahasabha. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Trial and sentencing, lower court. The trial began on the 27th of May 1948 and ran for eight months before Justice Atma Sharan passed his final order on the 10th of February 1949. The prosecution called 149 witnesses, the defense none. The court found all of the defendants except one guilty as charged. Eight men were convicted for the murder conspiracy, and others convicted for violation of the Explosive Substances Act. Savarkar was acquitted and set free due to lack of evidence. Nathuram Godse and Narayan Apte were sentenced to death by hanging and the remaining six including Godse's brother, Gopal, were sentenced to life imprisonment. Topic. Appeal, High Court Of those found guilty, all except Godse appealed their conviction and sentence. Godse accepted his death sentence, but appealed the lower court ruling that found him guilty of conspiracy. Godse argued, in his limited appeal to the High Court, that there was no conspiracy, he alone was solely responsible for the assassination, witnesses saw only him kill Gandhi, that all co-accused were innocent and should be released. According to Markovitz, Godse's declarations and expressed motivations during the appeal have been analyzed in contrasting ways. For example, while Robert Payne, in his detailed account of the trial, dwells on the irrational nature of his statement, Ashish Nandi underlines the deeply rational character of Godse's action, which, in his view, reflected the well-founded fears among upper caste Hindus of Gandhi's message and its impact on Hindu society. The appeal by the convicted men was heard from the 2nd of May 1949 at Peterhof, Shimla, Himachal Pradesh, which then housed the Punjab High Court. The High Court confirmed the findings and sentences of the lower court, except in the cases of Datatreya Parchor and Shankar Kisteya, who were acquitted of all charges. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Executions. Godse and Apte were sentenced to death on 8 November 1949. Pleas for commutation were made by Gandhi's two sons, Manilal Gandhi and Ramdas Gandhi, but these pleas were turned down by India's Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhbhai Patel and the Governor-General Chakravarti Rajagopalachari. Godse was hanged in Imbala jail on 15 November 1949. According to the Almanac of World Crime, at the hanging Apt's neck broke and he died instantly, but Godse died slowly by the rope. Instead of having his neck snap he choked. To death for 15 minutes. <inaudible> Censorship and judges' comments 
The government of India made the assassination trial public. It was widely followed until the day of Godse's statement. According to Awal Allo, the testimony of Nathuram Godse was so persuasive that the Indian government immediately banned it. Gopal Godse, a co-accused who was sentenced to life in prison, wrote a memoir which was published in 1967. It was immediately banned and circulating copies of it were seized by the Congress-led government because of fears that it promoted religious hatred between Hindus and Muslims in India. The complete Godse testimony and trial proceedings remained censored for nearly 30 years and were only published for the first time in 1977 after the Indian Congress party lost power for the first time since Indian independence, and the new government lifted the censorship. G. D. Khosla, one of the judges who heard the assassination proceedings, later wrote of the Godse statement and the reception of his reasons for assassinating Gandhi by the audience in the court. The audience was visibly and audibly moved. There was a deep silence when he ceased speaking. I have, however, no doubt that had the audience of that day been constituted into a jury and entrusted with the task of deciding Godse's appeal, they would have brought a verdict of not guilty by an overwhelming majority. <laughs> Aftermath Tributes After the assassination, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru addressed the nation by radio. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives, and there is darkness everywhere, and I do not quite know what to tell you or how to say it. Our beloved leader, Bapu as we called him, the father of the nation, is no more. Perhaps I am wrong to say that, nevertheless, we will not see him again, as we have seen him for these many years, we will not run to him for advice or seek solace from him, and that is a terrible blow, not only for me, but for millions and millions in this country. Gandhi's death was mourned around the world. Field Marshal Jan Smuts, former Prime Minister of South Africa, and once Gandhi's adversary, said, Gandhi was one of the great men of my time and my acquaintance with him over a period of more than thirty years has only deepened my high respect for him. A prince among men has passed away and we grieve with India in her irreparable loss." The British Prime Minister Clement Attlee said in a radio address to the nation on the night of January 30, 1948, Everyone will have learnt with profound horror of the brutal murder of Mr Gandhi and I know that I am expressing the views of the British people in offering to his fellow countrymen our deep sympathy in the loss of their greatest citizen. Mahatma Gandhi, as he was known in India, was one of the outstanding figures in the world today. For a quarter of a century this one man has been the major factor in every consideration of the Indian problem. Leo Amory, the British Secretary of State during the war said, It can be said that no one contributed more to the particular way in which the charter of British rule in India has ended than Mahatma Gandhi himself. His death comes at the close of a great chapter in world history. In the mind of India, at least, he will always be identified with the opening of the new chapter which, however troubled at the outset, we should all hope, will develop in peace, concord and prosperity for India." Lord Pethick Lawrence, the British Secretary of State in 1948 said, What was the secret of his power over the hearts and minds of men and women? In my opinion it was the fact that he voluntarily stripped himself of every vestige of the privilege that he could have enjoyed on account of his birth, means, personality and intellectual pre-eminence and took on himself the status and infirmities of the ordinary man. When he was in South Africa as a young man and opposed the treatment of his fellow countrymen in that land, he courted for himself the humiliation of the humblest Indian that he might in his own person face the punishment meted out for disobedience. When he called for non-cooperation with the British in India he himself disobeyed the law and insisted that he must be among the first to go to prison. He never claimed to be any other than an ordinary man. He acknowledged his liability to error and admitted that he had frequently learnt by his mistakes. He was the universal brother, lover and friend of poor, weak, erring, suffering humanity. Albert Einstein wrote, he died as the victim of his own principles, the principle of non-violence. He died because in time of disorder and general irritation in his country, he refused armed protection for himself. It was his unshakable belief that the use of force is an evil in itself, that therefore it must be avoided by those who are striving for supreme justice to his belief. With his belief in his heart and mind, he has led a great nation on to its liberation. 
He has demonstrated that a powerful human following can be assembled not only through the cunning game of the usual political maneuvers and trickery but through the cogent example of a morally superior conduct of life. The admiration for Mahatma Gandhi in all countries of the world rests on that recognition. The New York Times in its editorial wrote, "...it is Gandhi the saint who will be remembered, not only on the plains and in the hills of India, but all over the world." He strove for perfection as other men strive for power and possessions. He pitied those to whom wrong was done, the East Indian laborers in South Africa, the untouchable children of God of the lowest caste of India, but he schooled himself not to hate the wrongdoer. The power of his benignity grew stronger as his potential influence ebbed. He tried in the mood of the New Testament to love his enemies. Now he belongs to the ages. Over two million people joined the five-mile-long funeral procession that took over five hours to reach Raj Ghat from Birla House, where he had been assassinated. Gandhi was cremated in a funeral pyre. Criticism In some cases the response to this death were less adulatory. The Dalit untouchables leader Ambedkar, who had long criticized Gandhi and Gandhi's ideas as primitive and wrong, had a response of relief after he heard the news of Gandhi's assassination. He remarked after a momentary silence, My real enemy is gone, thank goodness the eclipse is over now. Archibald Wavell, the Viceroy and Governor General of British India for three years through February 1947, who had worked with Gandhi and Jinnah to find common ground, before and after accepting Indian independence in principle, remarked, I was greeted with the news of Gandhi's assassination, an unexpected end for a very remarkable man. I never accepted him as having much of the saint in his composition but he was extremely astute politician. Whether he did more harm or good for India it would be hard to say, but Indians will have no doubt, and he certainly hastened the departure of the British, which was his life's aim. But he wrecked the plan of the cabinet mission which might possibly have secured a united India and saved the massacres. I do not believe that he really worked for an understanding with the Muslims, when his influence might have secured it. He was always the lawyer and the banya who would drive a hard bargain and then find some legal quibble to deprive his opponent of what he had seemed to gain. I always thought he Gandhi, had more of malevolence than benevolence in him, but who am I to judge, and how can an Englishman estimate a Hindu? Our standards are poles apart, and by Hindu standards Gandhi may have been saint, by any standards he was a very remarkable man. Riots <inaudible> 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 Riots erupted in Bombay now Mumbai, on Gandhi's assassination, resulting in the deaths of more than 150 people. The Brahmin community in Maharashtra region bore the brunt of the riots with the looting and burning of Brahmin houses and businesses. The riots led to the internal migration of more than 5,000 Brahmins from the villages to the cities and cut off that community from its rural roots. Previous attempt in 1934 A prior, unsuccessful attempt, to assassinate Gandhi occurred on 25 June 1934 at Pune. Gandhi was in Pune along with his wife, Kasturba Gandhi, to deliver a speech at Corporation Auditorium. They were traveling in a motorcade of two cars. The car in which the couple was traveling was delayed and the first car reached the auditorium. Just when the first car arrived at the auditorium, a bomb was thrown, which exploded near the car. This caused grievous injury to the chief officer of the Pune Municipal Corporation, two policemen and seven others. Nevertheless, no account or records of the investigation nor arrests made can be found. Gandhi's secretary, Piarelal Nayar, believed that the attempt failed due to lack of planning and coordination. Legacy Gandhi's assassination dramatically changed the political landscape. Nehru became his political heir. According to Markovitz, while Gandhi was alive, Pakistan's declaration that it was a Muslim state had led Indian groups to demand that India be declared a Hindu state. Nehru used Gandhi's martyrdom as a political weapon to silence all advocates of Hindu nationalism as well as his political challengers. 
He linked Gandhi's assassination to the politics of hatred and ill will. According to Guha, Nehru and his Congress colleagues called on Indians to honor Gandhi's memory and even more his ideals. Nehru used the assassination to consolidate the authority of the new Indian state. Gandhi's death helped marshal support for the new government and legitimized the Congress party's control, leveraged by the massive outpouring of Hindu expressions of grief for a man who had inspired them for decades. The government suppressed the RSS, the Muslim National Guards, and the Khaksars, with some 200,000 arrests, for years after the assassination, states Markovitz. Gandhi's shadow loomed large over the political life of the new Indian Republic. The government quelled any opposition to its economic and social policies, despite this being contrary to Gandhi's ideas, by reconstructing Gandhi's image and ideals. In media Several books, plays and movies have been produced about the event. May It Please Your Honor was published in 1977, containing Nathuram Godse's statement to the court, after the Indian Congress Party lost power for the first time since Indian independence, and the new government lifted the censorship imposed since 1948 after gaining power in national elections. The text was republished in 1993 as Why I Assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. I, Nathuman Godse Speaking is a play composed by Pradeep Dalvi based on the assassination trial. Locally produced as me Nathuram Godse Boltoy, after seven sold-out shows it was banned in the state of Maharashtra in 1999 on directions from the then BJP-led coalition government in Delhi. Gandhi vs. Gandhi is a Marathi play that has been translated into several languages. Its primary plot is the relationship between Gandhi and his estranged son but it also deals briefly with the assassination. Nine Hours to Rama is a 1963 British movie based on Stanley Wolpert's novel of the same name, which is a fictional account of the final nine hours leading up to Gandhi's assassination. Gandhi and the Unspeakable, his final experiment with truth by James Douglas is a non-fiction book that seeks to understand not only the facts of the murder but its importance in the larger struggle between non-violence and violence. Hey Ram 2000 is a Tamil Hindi bilingual film by Kamal Hassan about a fictitious plot to kill Gandhi by a man devastated by the partition riots and his change of heart even as the real-life plot succeeds. In the 1982 film Gandhi the actor Harsh Nayar portrayed Godse at the beginning and the end of the film. See also Kapper Commission <laughs>